How's everyone doing today? Good? Let's see here. Let me make sure the Zoom session's going here. It's recording. Amanda, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I'm here. Okay. All right, we have a, an exam, right? A week from today, I believe. And so let me double check the schedule, but I'm pretty sure that's what we said last class. I think it was the 22nd. 22nd, yeah, isn't it? That is a week from today, yes? Yep, so next Wednesday, we have our first exam and it'll cover um, everything through, well, it's probably only gonna cover up through today's material. And that way, whatever's next week. So today we're going to do library of functions. What we do on Wednesday. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry. What we do on Monday, I will not ask you to be prepared for the test on Wednesday. Does that make sense? I don't. So today will be the last bit of material that'll be on Wednesday's exam of next week. All right. Okay. Um, I did do the video for the homework that goes with today's material. I just haven't posted it yet. So I'll do that um, later this evening. And were there any questions over anything from last time? No? Okay. All right. Let's get down to business. Um, so what today is about is this, this topic is library of functions. We'll get to it. I wanted to start class with something a little off topic, but we're, we're gonna actually talk about this a little bit later today. And that is our number system. Um, when you look at the numbers that we use in math, they can be broken into categories. And I just wanna make sure everyone understands what those categories are. So the first type of numbers that we have are the natural numbers. So zero, one, two, three, those are like the first numbers that humans ever started using, right? Actually, zero didn't come till later. It was one, two, three, and then the idea of zero was like this huge thing. Um, and we discovered you know, zero. And then after that, we have what are called the integers. The integers include all of these numbers. So that's why the circle goes around. It includes all these numbers, but now those numbers also negative, right? So we're actually gonna use this today. I'm gonna to refer to an integer and I just wanna make sure you understand the integers are like zero, one, negative one, two, negative two, three, negative three, four, negative four, okay. Then you have what are called the rational numbers and those are all the fractions, okay? And every number in here is a fraction. Just think about it, like the number two, two over one, right? You can look at that, or four divided by two is also two. So all the fractions include the integers and natural numbers. Then you have what are called the real algebraic numbers. Those are things that are like weird numbers like square root of two, uh, negative root three, one plus root five over two. Those are all called algebraic numbers. And then you have all the other ones, uh, the real numbers, these are called transcendental. And those are things like pi and e, those, those numbers, I'm sure you've heard of pi, e, we're gonna study a little more here. Uh, these two groups right here, the real algebraic and the real together, those two are called the irrational numbers. So I always like to, to ask students a question. Oh, what's going on here? Oh, oh, I have a little problem here. My software is acting weird. Okay, hold on. For some reason, it is displaying to the wrong. Let's do that. There we go. Amanda, you can still see the screen, yes? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. 
All right, so this is the, the question I like to ask. If you were to imagine the number line, oh, oh, and just look at the numbers between zero and one, okay? All, all the numbers that exist between zero and one. And if I were asking you to close your eyes, and you'll see a, a, a rag around here, it's like a black rag. There it is. I would ask you to just close your eyes, reach in there, get a number out. Okay. Number. What do you think the probability is that it's going to be a fraction? Like, like a, you know what I'm saying? 100%? What do y'all think? 100%? So you're saying, if I pick a number out here, guaranteed, I should be able to write it as a fraction. Guarantee. What do y'all think of that? Does everyone agree with that? What if I told you it was zero? Does that bother you? No, no, I'm saying, what if I tell you the, the probability of you picking up is zero? Do you think that would bother you a lot, right? Because there are definitely fractions in there. And there's not only fractions, there's, there's an infinite number of fractions in here, isn't there? I mean, I could keep going all day talking about the fractions in there. And I'm telling you, if you close your eyes and reach in there, the probability that you've picked a fraction is zero. And that, that is true, okay? It is true that it is zero. Now, I, have, I don't wanna go too far down this road because we can get lost down this road. The reason why is because there are two types of infinity, okay? Two types of infinity. Everyone here has heard the idea of infinity, right? But there's two types in our mathematical world. So the two types of infinity that we have are countable, what we call count, countably inf infinite, countable, and then the other one is uncountable. So let me give you an example of a countable set of numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You could do that for the rest of your life. You would die and the list would still, you, could, you know, you wouldn't have finished, right? But that is an infinite list of numbers that's countable. I like to think of it as like a lily, like a pond, an infinite pond with li lily pads, and you can kind of hop from one to the next. That's countable. Uncountable is this idea that there's an infinite number of things, but there's no easy way to like march through the numbers. Like you can't actually, like if you, if you try and step to the next number, you realize that you actually missed an infinite number of numbers. It's, it's a very weird concept. So it turns out that the picture I showed you earlier, this one, it turns out that the irrational numbers, all these right here, are uncountable. They're uncountable. But the fractions, which are in here, are countable, okay? There is a way that you could count your way through the fractions and not miss any. I'm not gonna get into how you do it, but there is a way to walk through the fractions one by one, not miss any. Of course, you'd never reach the end of the list, but you could do it in a systematic way. So because the irrational numbers are uncountable, when you look at the interval between zero and one, all the numbers between zero and one, there are a bunch of irrational numbers in here and a bunch of rational. So a bunch of fractions and a bunch of things that aren't fractions, but there's so much more that's not fractions, it's impossible for you to randomly go in there and get a fraction. It's impossible. Now, it still doesn't satisfy you, I know. So I have one more analogy that might make a little more sense, okay? If you've ever gone out away from the city at, at night, like real far away from city lights on a cloudless clear night and looked up in the sky, what do you see? Sorry, has anyone ever seen the Milky Way like go across the sky? Has anyone ever seen it with their own eyes? Yeah? So the Milky Way is just one of the, the, the strips of our spiral galaxy, right? It's one of the, the bands that you can see. And it's incredible if you see it with your own eyes. 
Um, so if you're out there on a dark night, you see all these stars, right? Think of the fractions as the stars, okay? So you could sit there and, oh, there's a star and you could start counting them, right? Okay, what do you think the irrational numbers are? The black, okay? The ones you can't see. Yeah, the ones you can't see. So it's, it's, it's everywhere and nowhere. Does that make sense? Like if I asked you to point to one of the irrational numbers, the black, you can't even point to it. It's, it's, it's everywhere and nowhere. It's so, such a weird thing. So if you were to close your eyes and if you had like a perfect pointer and point it into the sky and then open, the chances that you're actually pointing exactly dead on to a star is zero. That's what I'm trying to say. That's exactly what I, the analogy is with the number line. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. If not, it's okay. If you, if you don't like the idea, you want to study it more, become a math major, you study that, okay? And it all goes down to something called measure theory. And no, yeah, so, all right. But today, I just want to make sure everyone understands when I say integer, talking about this list of numbers, zero, one, negative one. All right. Um, have you all heard of imaginary numbers? They're not in here. Okay, real numbers is this group. Imaginary numbers, turns out that, uh, turns out that this group of numbers belongs to a bigger group of numbers called the complex numbers. And we do not study those, okay? We don't study them here. If you take calculus, you won't study them in calculus. If you take linear algebra, you won't study them in linear algebra. If you take differential equations, you won't study them in differential equations. It is until after the calculus sequence and a little further on that you actually start to study what are called the complex numbers. And there's a reason why. You can't visualize them. Like for us, we can visualize numbers on a number line, right? To visualize a complex number, you actually need four dimensions to be able to visualize the functions. So it's like we live in three dimensional space. So if you need four dimensions, that's that means you're not gonna be able to see the things you're working on. And so you, you can't study that until you've reached like a mathematical, like mental maturity level calculus that you can start to handle that sort of thing. So yeah, it's like we live in this little fishbowl, right? But it turns out it's part of the bigger world. Okay, moving on. Like I said, I can go down that road and just keep going and going and going. All right, so what is today about? Today is about a library of functions and a very important concept called piecewise defined functions. So the library of functions, the way I want you to think about what we're gonna do here in the beginning of class is that as you go into your next classes, pre-Cal, Cal-1, how many of you need Cal-1? I, I would assume most of you need Cal-1, yeah? You know, no? okay. So as you proceed into these classes, there's gonna be a set of functions that you should just know what they look like, okay? Like it shouldn't be like, oh, I need to go to graph and calculator. It should just be up here. So I look at, I think of it more of like a toolbox where you, you know, you have a toolbox, you open up, you got your hammer and screwdriver and different tools. This is basically, we're gonna build some tools into our toolbox. We need to know what they look like and then be comfortable as we go into different classes, being able to draw them very quickly. We shouldn't need to, reference anything, we should just know what they look like, all right? So the first function we're gonna look at is the square root function. I put together some stuff here. Let me bring it, if I can get it. This thing gets in my way. Here we go. All right, so the first function we're looking at is the function f of x equals the square root of x. All right, this is called the square root function. Let me put the actual function up here. F of X equals the square root of X. Now, let's talk about some of the properties of this, okay? Even, odd, or neither. Neither. This is not a reflection over the Y axis. It's not a double reflection. So it's neither odd nor even, okay? What is the domain of this function? Domain, zero to infinity, right? Zero to infinity. What about the range? Zero to infinity also. So when we say domain, we're talking, 
Where did the x's start and where did the end? It keeps going forever. Range is the y values, right? It's from zero up. Do we include zero in those? Does this, does this function actually include that point at zero? So can you plug zero in here is what I'm asking. Yeah, square root of zero is zero. So that point here does exist, right? That point does exist. So the domain of this is going to be from zero to infinity. And the range of this is also zero to infinity, right? It's neither even nor odd, right? Um, is it increasing or decreasing or constant? What is it? Increasing, increasing always, right? As you move from left to right, it's always going up. Do we have any x-intercepts? Just zero, right? Do we have any y-intercepts? Zero also, okay? Right, it only hits the x and y axis at the origin. Are there any questions on the way I'm doing this? Because this is what we're gonna do for each of these functions, just talk about them. Um, any questions on how you would actually graph this? Like how you could like pick points, like do a T table? Maybe we do it just real quickly for this one. If we pick some values for X, like plug in zero, square root of zero, zero, right? Plug in one, what's square root of one? One. Okay, let's not pick two because two is not a perfect square. So let's pick four. Square root of four is two, right? So those points are plotted here. At one, you get one. At four, you get two. So this thing is increasing, right? But it's kind of slow, right? It's kind of a slow increasing, but it keeps going forever. So there is an arrow at the end of this that keeps going forever and ever. Why is there no picture over here? Why is there no picture on the left-hand side? Because what? What is positive? What do you mean? Well, what's underneath the square root has to be positive, right? Can't, we cannot take the square root of a negative number unless we want to start talking about imaginary numbers. But like I said, we're not ready to deal with imaginary numbers. So for us, nothing will exist to the left. We good? You all ready for the next function? Okay, let me go back to the notes real quick. I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. What the heck is that? Let me see, I need to close this window out. Where is it? There it is, okay. So let me just make sure it's neither even nor odd. Okay, it's increasing the whole time. Oh, absolute max and min, we didn't talk about that. So on this function, are there any local maximums? Local maximums? No, you don't see any hilltops, do you? Okay, are there any local minimums? Yeah, there is a, there is a lowest point right here, right here, right? Now, what about a global maximum? Well, it keeps going up forever, so there's no global max, but there is a global minimum, right? Or an absolute minimum, and it's zero. The minimum value is zero, and it happens at zero when x is zero. Okay, I think now we can, we can move on. Uh, next function we're gonna look at is the cube root function, not the square root, but the cube root. What should be the big difference here? Can you take a cube root of a negative number? Yes. So when we graph it, it'll look like this. Now, please note, here's the square root function. They're not exactly the same on this side, okay? On the right-hand side, they're not like right on top of one another. The cube root function is a little bit different, but they kind of have a similar behavior to them. So this function we're looking at is the function f of x, equals the cube root. So the way we write cube root is a little cube right there, right? If we don't write anything, it's understood that it's a two. So that's the cube root. Uh, let me see here. One, is it James? James? No, James, James, no, hold on, Adam? Josiah, want number one. James, no, no, James. 
Don't tell me. I've got like three. That's to me. That's I'm, that's progress. That's progress. It'll come to me. Come. All right. So who wants to? Uh, let's go. Let's go just around the room. Okay. Let's go around the room, and I'll just let you answer the question. Okay. So we'll start this side this time. Okay. Go ahead and domain. Okay. Everything. Right. Good. So that's because the graph goes in both directions forever, right? Everyone got that? All right, moving on. Range. We'll go. So what about Y values? If you were to look down here, is there a graph somewhere to the left and to the right? Will you eventually hit the graph over there or over here? Yes? Yeah, okay, so and you can do that for any number down on the bottom, right? Any number on the bottom, you would be able to find something. And if I go up, same thing, right? All the way up. So how do we say everything from down to up forever? Negative infinity to infinity. But there we're talking about Y values, right? All Y values possible. Intercepts. Do we have any? Yeah. Zero, zero, yes? Yeah. Sorry, I was pointing zero, zero. Okay, so an X intercept of zero, zero, but we also have the same Y intercept, right? Okay. This next question is a little tricky. I'm gonna say, Chris, see four, I've got four. D, there's a D somewhere over here. Yes? Okay, we'll get to you, hold on, hold on. All right, at least I got, but see, you changed seats, didn't you? Okay, so that's gonna really mess me up, but I got you. All right, so my question to you is increasing, decreasing, or constant, does it change? Like, tell me about those things. Okay, so as we go from left to right, we're going up, 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 and then we go really up, and then, we keep going up, right? We never flatten out and we never go down. So this would be increasing always, right? So I could say it's increasing from negative infinity to infinity. Okay. Juan, we'll just go to Juan now. My question to you is, does it have any local maximums or minimums? No, so there's no local highest or lowest points. How about absolute maximum? No, right? It just keeps going, right? So there is no local highest or lowest points, and there is no global or absolute highest and lowest points. So no, no maximum ends on this one. Am I missing anything? I think we're okay. I'm going to ask one, one question that the book doesn't ask, but I know in calculus you have to understand about these pictures. Um, where is this function positive? In quadrant one. So what I'm asking is where is this picture above the x-axis? And so what you would say is from zero to infinity. All right. Where is it negative? N negative infinity to zero. Okay, good. We'll move on. All right, so the next function we're doing is the absolute value function. We talked about this last class a little bit. Remember I told you the absolute value function looks like a V and not a, a, not a U. We kind of looked at how we could graph it. Um, so for this function, let's go around the room here. Bothering me, just give me the first letter. Craig. Yeah, okay. I don't know, I said Adam, right? No, I said, what did I say first? James, James. Okay, Greg. All right, Greg, I don't know. What do you want to give me? Just give me some information about it. Domain is everything, right? So it's got picture to the left and right. So domain is everything. Good, you want to keep going? 
What about range? Zero to, do I include zero or no? Yes, yes because it actually has a point down here at the origin. Uh, let's move on. Sir, what's your first letter? James. What's that? James. Is it James? No. Oh. Yeah, oh, do you change seats? There was no seat over there. Okay. Yeah, I see that now. Okay. So I said just I was waiting for you to be over there. So that, that threw me off big time. Okay. Josiah too then. Josiah, um, how about what do you want? What information do you want to give me? I'll let you choose. What do you want? Okay, so let me do x intercept is also the y intercept, right? And that happens at zero, zero. And you said what? You have an absolute minimum. It happens at zero. And what is the value? Zero. So I like to write them as points. Like as a point, because if I write the absolute minimum as a point, then I'm giving you not only where it happens, but what it is. Okay, good, good. We'll move on. I just, I want to say, one part of me wants to say Dolores, another one wants to say Desiree. No? Dolores? No. Desiree? Yeah. Really? And then okay, give me your first letter. It, it's not there. Hold on. Give me more time. Okay, we'll go with Desiree. How about where is it increasing? Where is this function going up? Zero to infinity. Okay, I agree. Do you all agree? It's going up now. On the zero, do you want me to include a bracket or a parenthesis? Okay, now what do you all think? Is that right or wrong? It's right, but what did I tell you on class to be safe to do? Put a parenthesis. So for increasing and decreasing, to be safe, you can use a parenthesis and you'll be okay. In this case, it's okay to put a bracket because the function is defined at zero. Had there been a little hole there, then the bracket would be incorrect. So I'll do bracket because it's right. And Desiree, how about where's decreasing? Okay, so we'll write that from like from left to right, right? So like this. Oh, you know what we didn't do? We didn't talk about even or odd on the other one. Forgot that. We'll come back. We'll go back to the previous one. All right. So I thought, man, I was thinking yesterday, I was like, I've really got like this part of the room. I've got it, you know? And I'm now I'm, I'm falling apart here. Oh, okay. Does anyone else know her name? Don't, don't tell me. Do you do? I, it's not Larissa. It's not Larissa. Okay, just tell me. Lorena. So see, I had a little uh, at the end. Lorena. Okay, Lorena. Is this even, odd, or neither? Even, right? Reflection over the y-axis. Okay, let me go back to the previous one, Lorena. We didn't talk about this. The, the, the cube root, odd, very good. This is an odd function. Because it would be a reflect, reflect, it would land on itself. So for the cube root, it's odd. The square root was neither, right? Square root was neither. Cube root is, is odd. And then the absolute value is even. I think we're good. Can I move on? Okay, next function is a constant function. So constant functions are very boring. They're just flat lines. Okay, this is like f of x equals some constant k. So that's usually a number. Like in this case, um, it looks like it's the number, well, I'll put it up here, the number five, okay? So that's f of x equals five. All right, so how about we look at this, how about um, even or odd or neither? 
It would be even, wouldn't it? Because it is a reflection over of itself over the y-axis. So it's an even function. What about domain? Everything, right? Everything. Range. Okay, range is tricky. Range is tricky. In this case, it would just be the single number five. Okay, if that line were moved somewhere else, it would be whatever that y value is. So domain of this, the domain of this is everything. The range of this would be a single number. So we put that in a brace, remember braces on these? So in this case, I'm gonna put K because if we change the function here to F of X equals K, we're using five in this case, right? But in general, if it's K, then the range will just be that K value. Uh, we said it was even. Increasing, decreasing, or constant? Constant, always constant, right? It's constant, what, everywhere, isn't it? Uh, what else? Local max min, global max min. Yes. We have an absolute maximum, which is what? All, what's the value? What's the absolute maximum value here? What's the highest value you see? K or five in this, five in this case, K in general, right? So the absolute maximum would be K. What's the absolute minimum? K as well. This only works for flat lines. Your highest and lowest points are the same point. So absolute max is actually K, the value, and the absolute minimum is also K. Are we missing anything? Intercepts. Do we have any X intercepts? Not in that picture, right? Not in that picture. But what if I did this and put the line on the X axis? Then every point would be an X intercept, right? That's a special scenario though. So it is possible that the entire X axis, every point is an X intercept. But other than that, if it's not that line, then we will have no X intercepts, right? What about Y intercept? Y intercept um, would be K. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off there. Oh, that's okay, K or five? K or in this case, five. So the Y intercept here would be the point zero K in general or in this case, zero five. Are we missing anything? We feel like you have a general feel for that function? Okay, there's only 32 more to go. No, I'm kidding. Yes. When you use the brackets, what do you mean brackets? The braces, this one? If your answer is a single point, so when we talk about range, we're talking about what y values come out of this function. And the only y value that this function ever takes on is the number five, right? So the way we represent a single numerical answer is to use a brace. The parentheses give you an interval. It's everything between two things. All right, the next function, uh, now these are gonna start to get interesting, okay? There's gonna be some weird functions coming up here. All right, the next one is the identity function. Very important function in math. F of X equals X. This is called the identity function. Even or odd or neither. It's odd, right? If you reflect that top piece over and down, it'll land on the other one. So it is odd. What other things can you tell me about it? Start firing them off. It's, it's always increasing. increasing when, Amanda? Um, from negative infinity to infinity. Okay, good. Amanda, where do we have any intercepts? Um, zero and zero. Yeah, zero, zero. That's going to be both our x and y intercept. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me see. 
Cecilia, are you there? Yes, sorry, I am. Okay. How about domain and range? Is it negative infinity to infinity? On, on both, right? Yes. Okay, so both of them have every possible output, every possible input, right? Every number can be plugged in, every number comes out. Are we missing anything? Oh, local max min, absolute max min. None. There's no highest or lowest point on this graph. Okay, I think that's good. Again, this is a very important function. It's called the identity because it's f of x equals x. So whatever gets plugged in is exactly what comes out. You plug in five, it spits out five. Plug, out, plug in negative two, spits out negative two. It's, what comes out is identical to what goes in. It's the identity function. All right, next one. The squared function. I know a lot of you are familiar with this one. F of X equals X squared. Even or odd or neither? Even, okay, domain. Everything, right? Negative infinity to infinity. Range. Zero to infinity. Include zero or no? Yes. So bracket zero to infinity. All right. Where is this function increasing? Zero to infinity. So it's going up over here, right? On the right side. So zero to infinity. And to be safe, I'm just going to put zero to, oh, not to one. Zero to infinity. I'm gonna put the parentheses on the zero. I could put a bracket, but I'm gonna just put that to be safe. Is it ever decreasing? Negative uh, infinity to zero. Negative infinity to zero, good. What else? Local, local max. No local max. Absolute max. No. Local minimum. At zero, zero, right? Absolute minimum. Zero, zero. So we have an absolute minimum at this point, zero, zero. It's also the local, isn't it? So we talked a lot about this last class. When we talk about um, max and mins, there's a difference between where it happens and what the value is, right? That's why I said I always like to represent them as points, because I like to know when it's, where it's happening and what it is. We need anything else here? I think we're good, no? All right, we have one more kind of boring one, then things are gonna get a little interesting. So this is the cube function, not cube root. The cube function, f of x equals x cubed. This is odd, right, odd. The domain of this, everything, range, everything again, right? Everything comes out. We, it take, this function takes on every value possible. All right, where is this function increasing? Zero to infinity, it's going up. And over here too, right? So isn't it the whole time? Now we talked a little bit about this last class. What about right at zero? It seems like you flatten out, right? Exactly. So it never really flattens out completely. It comes to like just, just where it wants to be flat and then turns up. So in order to have flat, you have to have at least two points that are on the same height. And that doesn't happen here. So this is increasing all the time. You can say from negative infinity to infinity, it's always going up. All right. Anything else? Local max, local min. No, no local max, no local min. All right, we good? Now, remember, this. these videos will all be on there, you know, later on on YouTube, you can come back. But also in the, in the book, in the ebook, it has all this 
descriptions of each of these functions. So, all right, moving on. The reciprocal function. The reciprocal function. This is another very important function. It is the function f of x equals one over x. Hmm. Hmm. Let's look at this function for a minute. Zoom out on it there. Look at what it's doing. Like to the left, it looks like it's flattening out. As it comes towards zero, it looks like it drops down. Then over here, it goes up. And then to the right, it kind of flattens out again. Yes? Yeah, we get, if we go out to the side here and we just drag this point, look at, look at the Y value here, okay? It's gonna get smaller and smaller, 0.3. Oh, well, I want to let me drag more. I must have restrictions on that. I do have restrictions on it. Oops. Okay. Can't, oh, there we go. I can go over here. See, notice the Y value, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. If I kept going, no matter how far I go, I'm going to get a very small. Now, the computer is giving up, 0 0.009. It could keep on, if the computer wanted, it could have more decimal points, okay? So this is gonna be really important in calculus for you to understand what we call the end behavior of the function. For this particular one, as you go out to the right, it heads to zero. We will call those horizontal asymptotes later on in this class. It's not quite ready for that yet. May I ask a quick question? Yes, uh-huh. Does this kind of circle back to the whole idea of never really being able to touch the number five? Like if we do 4.9999 forever, we'll never truly touch five. It's same, it's the same, it's not the exact same statement, but it is the same concept that you can get closer and closer and closer okay. without actually ever getting there. Yes. Okay. All right, let's talk about um, even or odd. Odd. If we reflect this over the Y, and then over the x, it will land right on top of itself. So this is an odd function. What's the domain of this? What does it look like the domain of this is? So we looks like we have graph out here to the left all the way and some weird shit's happening here and then we got more graph here. So where's the weird stuff happening? At zero and notice that there's a problem with the function at zero, isn't there? If we look at this function one over X, you cannot plug zero into that, right? You'll get division by zero. So we have to pull zero out of our domain. So how do we say everything to the left of zero, everything to the right of zero, not including zero? Negative infinity to zero, right? Union zero to infinity. That would be your domain. That's everything except zero. How about range? This one's tricky too. We've got stuff down here, right? Come up, come up, come up. And then when we get here, do we ever actually hit the x-axis anywhere? No, right? So we're never gonna get a zero to come out of this function. So we skip that, but then once we go past zero, we have picture. So it should be the exact same thing as the domain, shouldn't it? Negative infinity to zero union zero to infinity. Okay, odd, domain, range. How about increasing? Is this function ever increasing? As you move from left to right, are you ever going up? No. No, you're never going up. You're always going down, aren't you? No. you just follow it, if you follow this, you can't tell, but you are, you are dropping there slowly. And then you get here, it drops, and then it drops up real fast. Now, when you go to the other side of the graph, if you were to move from left to right, you'd be dropping and then just dropping, not quite as fast, but you'd be dropping. So decreasing. So it's decreasing where? Everywhere except zero. See, we can't include zero because it's not in our domain. So it's decreasing from negative infinity to zero. 
union zero to infinity. We good? Okay. Absolute max or min? None. None, right? We don't have a lowest point on this graph. We don't have a highest point. And we don't have any hilltops or any valleys. So no locals. All right. Now, any computer science majors? Yeah, okay, so the next function is an important function. It's called the greatest integer function or in computer science, it's called the floor function. And for a lot of people, this is the first time they've ever seen a function like this. It's very different because it's not defined. You know how, you know how all these functions um, that we've looked at so far, it would be very easy for me to just tell you to plug in X and you just go plug it in, you know, like square root of X or if, I, if it was the squared function, x squared or, or one over x, you just plug the number into the actual thing, right? This next function, it, the definition of the function is, is a sentence, okay? It's, a, it's words, that's how we define the function. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you what it is first and bring it up here. Okay, it's called the floor function. I'm gonna copy this. Put it on a new page so we can pay attention to it. All right. The greatest integer function, another or called the floor function, is also abbreviated int x. Int x. And computers, a lot of times they use that, but int x is the notation for it. So you know how if I said, hey, the square root function, you would write f of x equals the square root of x. That's the notation that lets you know square root function, right? If, if I'm talking about this function, I just write int x, and then you should know what I'm talking about. So what it is, is the greatest integer, what's an integer? Zero, one, negative one, two, negative two, right? Those are all integers. So this, this function, what it does is it spits out the greatest integer less than or equal to the X that you're plugging in. So when we think about a number line, when we think about a number line, if we were to look at the integers, right? When we say a number, when we say a number is greater than some other number, greater means to the right of it on the number line, right? To the right, okay. So let's see if we can figure out what this function looks like. And the way I'm gonna do this is by doing the good old fashioned T table. I'm gonna start plugging in some numbers here. Here's X and this is gonna be int X. All right, let's start with zero. Okay, so if we plug in zero, right? Let's look at, the, let's look at what we're supposed to do with this. This function takes the number zero and it gives us the greatest integer less than or equal to that number we plug in. So what is the greatest integer that's less than or equal to zero? Which one is it? Negative one or zero? What's the greatest integer less than or equal to zero? Zero, right? Zero, because zero itself is an integer. That makes sense? So it returned to us zero. Now let's try something, we could plug in one. Well, what, let's think about what would happen if we do one. I'm gonna leave some space in here on purpose. What if we plug in one? What is the greatest integer less than or equal to one? One again, right? And what if I plug in two? Two, three, three, four, four. So what's happening on the integers isn't important. What's happening, what's important is the stuff happening in between. So let's try one, let's try not, not zero, let's go, uh, Let's go uh, 0 0.1. So 0 0.1, what would be the greatest integer less than 0 0.1? Zero, right? Because we'd be looking 0 0.1 is on the number line right here, right? What's the greatest integer less than or equal to that? Well, that's this number, right? So it's gonna spit out zero. What if I put in 0 0.2? Zero, 0 0.3. 
0.4, okay? And it's gonna be that for every number I plug in until I get to one. And remember, I can plug in an infinite number of numbers, but it's gonna be zero the whole time, right? Okay, so I'm gonna to start to try and graph this over here. What happens when I plug in zero? Zero, and when I plug in 0.1, zero. 0.2, zero, 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 until I get to one. What happens when I get to one? I jump up to one. It's gonna look like a staircase. So when I plug in one, I get this, right? Now, what's happening down here? What do I put here? Never getting there, right? So I don't have a point here at, at one, it's up here, isn't it? So I'm gonna put a little circle here just so you know that that's a hole there, right? And at zero, it was a solid dot. Now we said when you plug in two, you're gonna get what? Two, so at two, we should get two, that dot there. But what about if you're trying to plug in numbers between one and two, like 1.1 or 1.2, 1.3, what do you get? One. one, right? Understand that? If I plug in 1.1 or 1.2, so I plug in 1.1, it's at one. If I plug in 1.3, one. 1.5, one. 1.9, one. 1.99999, one. 1. 9, 9, 9, 9, 1, right? The whole time, until I get to two, that's when it jumps up. Like that. And it will continue this. And it actually continues this way. And it continues down this way. So I'm not going to go and do any more, but let's take a look at the actual graph of the floor function. It's so cool. Such a cool function. Is it a function? Passes the vertical line test, doesn't it? Right? Even or odd? Ooh, tricky. Tricky. Is it odd? Is it odd? Let's see. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see. Let's see. This is tricky. Is it odd? I don't think I've ever asked myself this. Let me take just this one piece right here and reflect it over the, the y-axis. If I did that, it would come over here as a dot and then come over here as open, wouldn't it? And then if I reflect that down, what happens? I'm here. That's not a reflection. That's not a double reflection. So it would wind up down here is this and that. That doesn't land. So it's not odd. It's definitely not even, right? Not a reflection over. Okay. So neither even nor odd, right? Okay. And uh, is it constant, increasing, decreasing? I think Pardon? it's constant. It's constant, but on each little piece, right? Yeah. It's like it's constant in between this piece, this piece, this piece. That's right. Well, is it increasing though? Because increasing means that you have to be, when you take a step, you have to go up. Okay. That's a good, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Is this increasing? Because as you walk from one point to the next, do you go up? No. And then what about here? This is a really complicated question. This, this is why this is an interesting function. Are we increasing when we get to this little dot and move up? You can't get to the dot. You can't get to that open circle because you can always take a little steps closer to it. But you can't ever say, oh, ready to take the next step, I go up because there is no next point right next to it. So it's a very complex idea here, but it's, it's not increasing, it's not decreasing, it's constant on little intervals, yes? So is, what's the domain of this? To infinity, everything. It would be everything because let's just start right here, okay? Let's just start right here. This x value, am I, 
is my function defined here? Oh, that's hard to do. <laughs> yes, right? Go here. Is it defined? Yes. Go here. Is it defined? Yes. Is it always defined? Yes. Even when I get here, I have a hole down here, but I have a solid dot here, right? So it's defined. Everywhere I go, I've got graph. And I could go in both directions, right? Both directions. So the domain of this should be everything. Now the range is harder. What about the range? Every integer is our range. The only outputs of this function are integers, right? Can somebody tell me like in, in layman's terms what this function is doing? I, you give it a number and what does it do to that number? Uh, not up, it rounds it down, but not even using any rounding rules. It just says, it's not the next highest if it's not the next highest number, it's coming down. If it's not, not the next highest integer, it's coming down, right? Computer scientists need that function a lot. Okay, because, well, they use it for many applications, but it's rounding down, basically, right? Understand? Uh, so the range of this are the integers. How do we say integers? Other than writing the word down. Is there a notation for integers? You could write INT, but in math, we actually have a nice notation for it. Okay, it is a capital double struck Z. Have y'all seen this one before? Have y'all seen that? That's the uh, real numbers. Okay. Th that's a double struck capital R is what we call it. Double struck capital R. A double struck capital Z is what, the, what we use to represent the integers. So every integer comes out of this, right? Really kind of a cool function. Um, now, we call this the floor function. Do you see why it's the floor? It's, it, it's always dropping down to, you know, you plug in number always drops it down to the nearest integer. There's another function that the book doesn't talk about that computer scientists use, and it's not called the floor. What do y'all think it's called? The ceiling function. And what do you think it does? It rounds it up, but not using our stupid rounding rules, right? It's just like, it's going up no matter what, as long as it's not the integer below, it's going up. So instead of 1.1 going down to one, it's gonna take 1.1 up to two. Now the book doesn't talk about this, but I took, oh, I didn't graph it. Huh, I thought I did. Oh, well, well, it'd be easy to graph because all I'd have to do is take this function and add one to it. So that would be that would be the ceiling function, because uh, let me zoom in here. See if I plug in an input like 0.19, it, it takes it up to one. I plug in 0.38, it takes it up to one. And when I get to when I get to one, it takes it up to two. Okay. All right. So, or sorry, I should say when I. When, I two, when I'm at two, I'm at two, is what I should have said. Sorry, when I'm at one, I'm at two, and then keep going. What? I'm wrong. This should be open and this should be closed for the ceiling. But it's all right, the book, the book doesn't talk about it. Okay, we good? Yes, yes. See, that's what I'm saying. Forget those rounding rules. What it's doing is it's saying, I'm dropping you to the floor no matter what. Normally, when we round, right, we say 1.5, you could round that up to two. This function says, forget your rounding rules. If it's 1.5, I'm dropping you down to one. If you're 1.9, I'm dropping you down to one. Dropping you to the floor every time. It's almost, a thing, here's another way to think about it. It's like a birthday. It's like a birthday function, right? Like if you say you're 20 years old, even though you had your 20th birthday, right? 
you're moving towards 21. All the time up until you're 21, you're going to say you're 20, right? Until the day you turn 21, then you say you're 21. Then you're 21, right? But when you're 21, when you're 20 and 300 something days, you still say 20. Does that make sense? Cuts up, takes up, it, but takes you down, right? Yeah, you can say that. Just takes off that for the floor function. Yeah, it just takes off that end end part. Yes. What's that? Because when you get to that number, like when you get to one, you have to jump up. Let me uh, let me bring it back up here. I, I accidentally did something that messed something up. How do I undo? Oh, there it is. Never find that. There. Okay. So what you're saying? Why is there an open circle like here? Okay. So I'm going to drag my cursor. See, 0.35. It's rounding that. Basically, it's dropping it back down to zero. Okay. So zero, zero, zero. But what happens when I get to one? When I actually get to one, since one is an integer, it spits out one. So I have to have an open circle there just to represent, just so you don't accidentally think that there's a dot here. Because if there was a dot here and there, it failed the vertical line test, right? It wouldn't be a function. Okay. Now, we talk about a separate topic. Everything I've shown you right now is when you do your homework, you're not going to see any of this. What you're going to see is this next part, which incorporates this idea. All right. So we're now going to talk about the all important piecewise functions. Piecewise functions. So a lot of times in the real world, we need functions that behave a certain way. And then after a certain point, change and start behaving a different way. And so what we can create are what are called piecewise functions. So here is a function that we are defining. I'm gonna copy it and put it on a different page. All right, so look at this function right here. This function f of x is equal to and then I have a brace. You see the brace? The brace is telling you that this function has multiple parts to it. It's actually made up of, of, of different functions. The first function it's made up of is the function negative 2x. The second function is the square root of x. So there are two pieces to this function. The piece in green is only when x is less than zero. And the part in blue is only when X is greater than or equal to zero. So it's kind of telling you when you plug something in, you're either gonna plug it into this one or this one. What dictates which one you use is what the X you're plugging in is. If the X you plug in is less than zero, you're gonna use the top one. If your X is greater than or equal to zero, you're gonna use the bottom one. So let's try to figure out what would happen if I just start asking you some things like this. What would f of four be? So first question is, what are we plugging in to this function? What number? Four. four. So first thing we do is we look at the two inequalities here and we determine, is that, x, is that x less than zero or greater than or equal to zero? Greater, right? So we're gonna use the bottom function, the bottom. So that means when we plug in four, we're gonna be using the square root function and the square root of four is what? Two, make sense? Somebody give me another X value that I would plug into this function and use that same bottom piece. Nine, okay, so if I did F of nine, then that would be, of course, nine is bigger than or equal to zero. So we would get square root of nine, which would be Three and thank you for using nine because I could take square root of nine. If you said five, then I'd be like crap. Need a calculator, right? Okay. How about f of zero? The bottom function. Why the bottom one? Because that little bar, right? That little bar underneath that. 
tells us this is the one we use when it's equal. So what would it be? Square root of zero, which is zero, right? All right, let's, let's plug in an X that would be using the other side. So negative, negative four, that's what I heard, negative four. So negative four is definitely less than zero. So we plug it into the top one, negative two times negative four, and that gives us eight, right? One more, what would be another X value we could plug in that would make us use the top piece? Negative one. So we had negative two times negative one, that is two. Make sense? That's usually the easy part for piecewise functions is just plugging numbers in because you just figure out which one you're in then you just plug it in. The hard part is graphing them. Okay, that's the hard part. So that's what we want to be able to do. We want to be able to graph these. So let's see. I am going to have to rely on your background. So just let's take a quick minute. And this, I, I don't know your background, but I'm hoping that all of you are familiar with this formula for the equation of a line. You've probably seen it, y equals mx plus b. Okay, yes, does it look familiar? So when we have this, this number here represents the what of the line? Slope, and then the b represents the what? Y-intercept. And once you have a slope and a y-intercept, you can draw the line, right? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad most of you responded to that. Now I'm gonna go back, grab this again, and let's mess with this. Let's see if we can sketch this. Okay, so here's how I'm gonna do it. First thing I'm gonna do is draw myself an X and Y axis. Okay. And I'm gonna start with this top function, this blue one. And I'm gonna to say to myself, hey, that's a line, right? I recognize that as being something like y equals negative two x plus zero. That looks like a like a like a y equals mx plus b, doesn't it? Where the slope is negative two and the y-intercept here would be zero, right? So if you were asked to draw this, what you would do is start at the y-intercept, which would be zero, where that red dot is. And then to get to another point, what would you do if the slope is negative two? Right, look, look at it as negative two over one, right? And Go down two. Down two, right one. Or you could go up to left one. It depends on how you want to look at it. But usually the negative two, we'd say is our rise. So we go down by two into the right one. So if I go down two, right one, I draw a dot. Once I have two points, I can draw a straight line, can I? Now we have to be kind of precise here. So I'm gonna use my computer to draw a line. Every time I do this, it never wants to cooperate. Ooh, that's not bad. Okay, there we go. That would be the line negative two X, right? But, but we don't want that line. We want that line only to the left of zero, right? Only to the left of zero. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna come in here, redraw the line, I'll do it on top of it and I'll do it in blue. We want this line only to the left of zero. And what about at zero? Do I want that line at zero? zero. No, circle, open circle, right? Because that do doesn't have a bar there. So I'm gonna put a little bar there, like, I mean, sorry, a little circle there. And now I'm gonna erase the red part. So that first red part was just so I could get the picture there. And then I only drew it to the left of zero. With me? Moving on to the yellow piece, square root of X. Now we just studied that, right? We should all know what that looks like now, right? So it starts out at zero, zero. which actually fills that hole in, doesn't it? And then it continues out this way, like that. It's actually not quite, I could be more accurate. At one, it's one. At four, it's two. 
so on and so forth. But there it is. Got it? What's the domain? Everything. Everything, everything right? What's the range? Zero to infinity, including zero, right? Even odd? Neither. Decreasing? Negative infinity to zero, in parentheses. Increasing? Zero to infinity, right? So that now we want to be able to start kind of cranking out these ideas. Local max doesn't have a local max or absolute max, right? How about minimum? At zero, zero, right? At that point, we have a local minimum and an absolute minimum, right? Okay. Let's, uh, let's do another one. How about one that has three pieces? Uh, we didn't talk about the x-intercept, but I think you'll understand that, right? As x and y-intercept, okay. All right, so why don't we do this? Why don't you work on this? You can work together, we'll make it worth your time. Put it on a piece of paper, and we'll, and those of you at home, just, um, you can email me, email me what you have. Um, you'll turn it in today. So do it on a separate little piece of paper, put your name on it. Um, work together. I'll give you all only about, I don't know, 10 minutes. I'll count this as something. I'm not sure what yet. Everyone does their own. You can work together. See if you can draw this piecewise function. Once you draw it, I want you to answer a couple of questions, okay? The questions I'm gonna ask for, well, you know what, the questions are here. I'll just put this back up. Are you going to put variables for this or do we draw on What do you mean? What do you mean variables? Oh yeah, that was just to kind of like give you an idea of what to do. How about you do this? Find f of negative two, f of one, f of two. Find the domain, locate any intercepts, graph it, and then find the range. I would start with the graph personally, because the graph really helps you kind of understand everything. Feel free to move around if you want to sit next to someone. If you want, don't want to, you don't have to. Yes. Let's be pretty accurate. I mean, it like, cause these are, these functions are pretty easy to graph accurately, right? That's something that you should be able to do. X squared, you should be able to do. So, you know, do a little grid and kind of space things out properly. Do the best you can. Don't just scribble it. Cause you could do real fast sketch of this, right? Try and be pretty accurate. All right. We'll say 10 minutes. When you're done, just, just put them up. And Amanda and Cecilia, you'll email me those, right? After class? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for part A, just plug those three values into that function. I, w I really want to make sure that you get this right because it's going to be worth something, all right? So feel free to check with each other. I'd hate for you to turn something in and then you never like ask anyone around to do the same thing. I'll be right back.
Could someone put some more tequila in the margarita machine, please? Y'all doing all right? Anyone have questions? I'd be happy to help. I don't want to do it for you. Do you know what negative 2x plus 1 looks like? Can you just draw it on your graph? Oh, yeah. Okay. Start with that. Right. You know what the slope is? You know what the y-intercept is? For that one? This is a line, right? So on your graph, can you draw it for me? Do you, do you know how to draw it? Rise, yeah. So start with the y-intercept, and then from there, do rise over run. So what's the y-intercept? Down two to the right one. Just rewrite that negative two. Negative two over one. And then go down to right one. And then connect those with a straight line. Do it real lightly in pencil because you're going to be racing part of it because, oh, it's all right. Yeah. I mean, I can switch it right now. Yeah, switch it before you draw it. Okay, or questions? Okay. Guys? Yeah. Professor, I'm just a little bit lost on the first one. Okay. 
Okay, so you know what? It's been 10 minutes. Here's the deal. I have to give you all a different one. Let's go through this one. I think there's too many questions. Yes. Yes, it's a constant. Yeah. Between. Yeah, let me work through this one. Okay, and then I'm going to give you all a separate one. All right. Amanda, this will address your question, I think. Okay, thank you. Okay, so look, here's here's my graph. I'm going to start out. Uh, where's my graph? You know what, let me zoom out. Oh, what the heck? I lost my little bar down there. Okay, we need to make this smaller. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna start with the with the x y axis. I don't know why that's highlighted. Okay, I've got all sorts of problems here. Can't even draw a damn graph right now. Let me just do it. Here's my x y axis. Okay. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is draw negative two x plus one. I know that that's a line. It hits the y axis at one and has a slope of negative two or one. So down to right one. So I start out at one on the y axis. And then from there I go down two to the right one. If I need to do it again down two to the right one that'll help me draw a straight line. And it continues up like this, okay? Go with me on that. Now, I don't wanna draw the whole line though. I only wanna draw that line between X, when X is between negative three and positive one. Negative three, including negative three. So if I go to negative three, negative one, negative two, negative three, I actually want my graph to stop here at that point. Understand, I'm putting a solid dot because it included negative three. Yes or no? Now, I'm supposed to go between negative three and one, but not including one, right? Not including one. So that means when I go to one on the x-axis, I go down. That point needs to be an open circle. Ah, oh, shit. That needs to be an open circle here. Okay, so now that I've got that basically laid out, let me draw it in a different color. I'll do it in red. It's gonna be a line that comes down like this, open circle here, solid dot there, and I can get rid of everything else. Yes. Like how high up? Yes. Well, you could figure that out by just plugging negative three in here, right? If you plug negative three in here, you'll get negative two times negative three is six, then plus one would be seven. Make sense? Okay, that takes care of just the first part. Now look at the second part. Second part says, if X is one, just the number one, I'm gonna get an answer of two. So when I go to one on the x-axis, the function should spit out the number two. Oh, that's not two, that's three, sorry. That's two. See that? When I plug in one, I get two. 
Then we're going to have the third piece, which is x squared, right? We know what x squared looks like. So I'm going to draw x squared. I'm going to kind of be accurate, kind of accurate with it. So we know x squared goes through 0, 0. What happens when I plug 1 into x squared? 1 squared is 1. What happens when I plug in 2 into x squared? 4. When I plug in 3 into x squared? 9, way up there, right? So I know that this thing looks like this. With me? Now, technically, it goes the other way too, right? But I'm only trying to draw it when x is bigger than one, not including one, right? Bigger than one. So my picture, my actual picture, needs to have an open circle here. See the open circle at one? And then everything to the right. So it should be all of this over here. And I don't need the other part of the parabola that I drew. It's not the best picture in the world, but it's pretty good. Does that make sense? Now I'll show you, I did it on the computer already. So here's what it looks like drawn properly on the computer. That's the graph on the computer. Okay. Actually, you know what, hold on. I gotta zoom out here because yeah, it stops. Sorry, it stops up there. This is what it looks like. Questions. One point, right? Because it said when X was one, right? X equals one, it wanted two to come out, right? That middle piece of the function. When X is equal to one, just spit out two. When X is bigger than one, do this. When X is less than one, do this. Is this, is this, did that help a little bit to go through that again? No? What, what's confusing you? What about it? The picture of it or why I started it here? Or, because when does it say we're supposed to be this picture? When are we supposed to be X squared? Whenever X is bigger than one, right? So imagine that we have like this imaginary line that goes through the X value of one, okay? This parabola only should exist to the right of that because it says X bigger than one. So we go only, only draw this parabola to the right of that one. Of course, in real life, that thing actually continues like that, but we only want the picture to the right of one of that parabola. I'm just a little bit confused of the, um, if ne if it's negative three and then it's uh, less than or equal to the X and then um, less than the one. Okay. More than the one. Okay, so if, if I go to X's, um, let's go to X is negative three, same thing. Here's X, here's X is negative three, right? And then, X is one is over here, this other blue line, right? Mm -hmm. X being between those two or X values on that X axis, right? Between negative three and one. You see that? Okay. Yes, that's what that inequality yes. means. So if you're in, if you're looking between here and here, the graph that you should see is this line negative two X plus one, right? Okay, um, yes. So do we include the X or no? Do we include the endpoints or no? Is um, that what you're X, saying? Uh, do we include the X that's in the middle do, or is it the X as an open circle? Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, so it's, it's gonna be anywhere from the negative three to the one and we're gonna include um, X, whatever X is. And no, X should be between. This, okay, so what this part in, uh, let me see, I'm gonna circle it in red. What this is telling you, this is letting you know when you use that function. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, so it's saying if you try and plug in a value of X and that, that, that value of X happens to be between those two numbers, 
then you're going to plug it into this function. So like right now, if I plug in negative two, let's say, right? Negative two into this function, I'm gonna be plugging it into this top piece because negative two is between these numbers, right? Yes. And so I plug negative two in here. If I plug negative two in, I should get five. So I come up and I plot that point. That's the point negative two, five. Okay. And that should be for any point that I plug in between negative three and one. So if I go to negative three, plug in, I should get a solid dot there. But if yeah. I go to one, if I go to one, I should not get anything because I'm not allowed to be, when, I, when I'm up on this function, right? This is what you do when you're less than one. If you're equal to one, you're actually gonna spit out the value two. Mm -hmm. So that's why I left an open circle on this right endpoint. Okay. That sounds like an agreeable okay. That's not. The are you really okay? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay, yes. yeah, these take a little bit. Let me, uh, so why don't I put one up here for y'all now, okay? And this one, I want you to see what you can do with, all right? This will be to turn in, let's say, I'll give you some time on it. So let's say um, to be turned in before class next time, or like people who are gonna be here, just bring it with you. Online, just be, when, before we start our Zoom session on Monday, make sure you e emailed it to me, all right? Okay. Okay, so here's the piecewise function. I want you, I'll put the instructions of what I want you to do in a second. Let me put the piecewise function. So it's going to be, I'm gonna make it four pieces just for fun. For, Cause I know that you are going to wanna to enjoy this. Okay. So the first one is going to be negative X plus one. If the X, is less than negative three, okay? Then I want it to be x squared if x equals negative three. Then I want it to be two x minus five if x is bigger than negative three, less than or equal to two. And the absolute value of x if x is bigger than two. So here's what I'd like to know. Part A, find F of negative five. Then I want you to find F of negative three, F of zero, F of two, F of four. That's just making sure you understand how to plug values into this function, which piece you use depending on where the X lies. And then part B, I wanna know, well, just go ahead and sketch it, okay? Sketch it, we'll make that part B. Part C, give me the domain. Part D, Give me the range or E, give me any intercepts. Was that a big old sigh that I just heard? But if you draw the picture, you should be able to answer those questions, but the picture has got to be right. We still have five minutes, so um, I'm gonna end class, you're free to go, but uh, I'll hang out if you have questions or if you wanna, you know, kind of start this a little bit and get going with it, whatever. Anyone have any questions? This is the last bit of material that'll be on the exam. So 
you will get something like this on the exam. Yeah, oh, I, I will send out a review. I just haven't made one yet. Um, I need to make one, probably make one tomorrow. I'm giving a test tomorrow. So while I'm giving that test, I'll probably make the review for you guys. So um, I will send that out hopefully tomorrow evening. So we did, did we do one class where I was on the board? I did, right? One class where I was on the board and I had the camera in the room. Is this working for y'all, this setup? Because, I mean, I prefer to be walking around, but this to me works for the Zoom people and I can graph things easily. Okay, I'll ask you again in a, in a couple of weeks. Any uh, questions from, from online? Uh, no, sir, everything was uh, pretty good today. It was decent <laughs> okay, to, good. to understand, so. Good, good. Well, also there's a homework assignment, right, for this, that's uh, the online homework. So I, I'll post those solutions. We're sitting here. I'm gonna stop the recording though, if that's okay.